My name is Mark Powell. I am an applications engineer with Agilent Technologies. And today I'll be talking about getting the most out of your LC system. We may use LC systems every day or only periodically, shared with a group or individually. There are many issues that come up that can limit our productivity when we're using an LC system. You may come into the lab and not know what state the LC is in, how it was left, who used it last. How old is the solvent? Is it still good? If you're sharing an instrument, you may not know what was recently run on the instrument or whether any system errors or issues occurred. All of these and more issues can make you stop and think. They take time to resolve and ultimately delay analysis. If your system isn't running properly, your data may be unreliable and require troubleshooting or rerunning samples. You want to minimize how long it takes to answer these questions so you can get your LC analysis started quickly and confidently. The goal of this webinar is to help you understand your LC system and be able to identify common issues, troubleshoot them quickly, and get your system back up and running as quickly as possible. You want to be confident in your system and its performance, knowing that you're getting reproducible results. At the same time, understanding your system will help in being able to quickly identify red flags in system performance that can lead to system downtime, so you can prevent issues before they come up. By doing this, you can interact with your system very efficiently and minimize the time wasted and the frustration of extended troubleshooting. Today, we'll go over tools available and preventative maintenance timelines. Then we will look at the overall LC system from mobile phases, pump, injector, to detector. We'll take a look at the effect of different capillaries and fittings, and we'll also review some resources that you have available to you to help you better understand your system. This presentation is for all LC users from beginner to expert, from people who maintain their instrument to people who have a service contract. If you're an LC user, this is for you. We'll cover system preventative maintenance basics, offer tips for daily use, and take a look at some newer technologies that can improve your day-to-day -day efficiency when using your LC. My hope is that everyone will be able to come away learning something new so you can get the most out of your LC system. So let's start off with some useful tools and timelines. This presentation covers technical content that is general to all LC systems. We will show examples on our Agilent systems, and you will see some references to part numbers or supplies. Always refer to your own user manual or user guide for your system. For Agilent systems, we have quick reference guides, or QRGs, and we also have the Infinity Lab Supplies Catalog that outlines all the parts for your specific system or module. Now, we also get a lot of questions about PM or preventative maintenance timelines. For instance, what frequency should we re replace a pump seal or a lamp? Now, this is very difficult to answer as we know our customers use our instruments at different frequencies and for different applications. PM timelines can depend on a lot of things, including how well the system is maintained and used uh, relating to user expertise, how frequently the systems are used, the complexity of the samples injected, the mobile phases used, uh, which could include buffer salts, as well as the LC techniques used, which might include normal phase solvents. Also keep in mind the analytical sensitivity you require. A system may perform perfectly for your application, but may require more specific or frequent maintenance for highly sensitive applications. Now in this presentation, I'll point out some common issues, what they can be related to, mobile phases, samples, system issues, and offer tools to help you set up a preventative maintenance timeline that works best for you, such as our Lab Advisor software. Now, every instrument will have slightly different features, but operates on the same basic LC principles. The flow path for LC instruments starts with the solvent bottle, moving to the pump, injector, column, and then the detector. It's important to understand the flow path components so you can quickly identify where leaks or blockages can occur. 
knowing what consumables to replace on a regular basis can also prevent issues and downtime. Definitely look into the details of your particular instrument and figure out what does it offer you. What are your LC software capabilities? Are there products or features within your system that can simplify use or help you diagnose issues quickly? Nowadays, there's a lot more technology integrated into your instruments that can make your LC simpler to operate. These can help improve the quality of your data and the speed at which you get correct results from your LC. Remember too that we often think of chromatography issues as being a result of the column, but there can be issues beyond the column that can affect your separation. So it's really good to understand the behaviors of your particular system. Here's a diagram showing two basic instrument configurations. The instrument setup and the way they're stacked might be slightly different, but the flow path will generally be the same. In both cases, we're moving from the solvent cabinet to the degasser, pump, auto sampler, column, and detector. Now this is a typical stack for a 1100, uh, 1200, 1260 system, the classic infinity systems. Some of the newer 1290, infinity two systems, the pumps on the bottom, but again, we're still moving from the solvent down to the degasser and the pump through the auto sampler column and to the detector. Make sure you take the time to understand and know the flow path of your instrument setup. I just want to take a moment here to highlight an Agilent innovation that allows for easy system setup and maintenance, the Infinity Lab flex benches. There are three different configurations to meet the unique needs of any HPLC or LCMS laboratory. The bench top, the flex bench, and the flex bench MS. These flex benches allow you to modify the height of your instrument for easy access to solvent bottles. The flex bench and flex bench MS allow you to relocate instruments to where you need them, such as next to your mass spectrometer. They also give you more flexibility in how you set up your LC system. If you look closely at the FlexBench MS example here, you might notice the pump is now at the top of the instrument, whereas on the last slide we saw it at the bottom. And they have a number of interchangeable shelves and accessories, such as a tray and a drawer for your most frequently used tools. Next, let's begin to move through the instrument flow path starting with solvent management. All separations start with mobile phase. So what's in your solvent bottle is extremely important. If there's any contamination here, it will carry through and even accumulate in your system. That can set you up for a very long and frustrating troubleshooting session. Things you might observe in your LC analysis related to solvent contamination are ghost peaks, higher back pressure, degasser problems, even column lifetime issues, as debris or microbes collect on the inlet of your column. Let's avoid this. Definitely use HPLC or even MS grade solvents, depending on your sensitivity requirements. We have Agilent Infinity Lab Ultra Pure LCMS solvents available. Use clean glassware. Rinse it with a bit of mobile phase before you fill it up. You can use a solvent inline filter to catch larger debris or dust that might happen to be in your bottle, but there's really no substitute for good, clean lab practices here. If you're using any buffers or salt solutions, it's a good idea to filter your mobile phase, but be sure the filter membrane material is compatible with your solvent. Aqueous mobile phase is a perfect host for microbial growth especially sitting in a warm lab or in the sunlight in your lab. Microbes are tiny and can accumulate in the smallest corners of your system or even pass through the column inlet frit onto your column. This can cause contamination and high back pressure. Don't let your aqueous mobile phase sit for many days. It should be replaced frequently. You can always add a small percentage of organic solvent to your mobile phase, say 5%, to inhibit microbial growth. There are also amber bottles that can help reduce light exposure to your solvents.
Now, I'm not sure about you, but my hands are kind of small, and those big mobile phase bottles can be a little hard to grip for me, especially if they're full of solvent or if they're a little bit wet. Sometimes I'd have solvent spill out, affecting the concentration if I was making up new mobile phase. Then I'd have to start all over. Now, there are new solvent bottles available that have a narrower core, making it much easier to grip. These Infinity Lab solvent bottles are much easier to handle, and you can add Infinity Lab Stay Safe caps on them to manage your solvent's lines better. The Stay Safe caps also prevent solvent evaporation, which is great for those organic solvents that might sit on your system for some time. Organic solvents and some additives are volatile, which can affect the composition percentage. Sometimes even a small change in composition can affect your separation, so it's best to be safe. Infinity Lab Stay Safe caps have a handy time strip that will tell you when to change the filter. Approximately every six months, depending on the solvent and the use. There's also a Stay Safe cap for waste containers that have a charcoal filter and that same handy strip that lets you know when it's time to change the filter. Next, let's talk a little bit about the degasser in your LC system. Once we have our solvent all properly prepared, it'll go into the degasser. Be aware that there are different degasser types that use different technologies. Some newer degassers perform better and are easier to flush due to some design improvements. On most LC instruments, the mobile phase flows through a vacuum degasser. The degasser module might be a separate module or it might be integrated into the pump. You will always wanna keep an eye out for bubbles in the outlet lines, especially when changing solvents. If you're using buffer salt, you'll want to avoid blockages in the degasser tubing by flushing them out with water when changing mobile phases. And when you're switching solvents, make sure they are miscible. As with the solvent bottles, don't leave aqueous mobile phases in the degasser for extended periods of time to avoid microbial growth. Unused channels should be flushed free with water to prevent crystallization of any buffers, and then left in isopropanol. Isopropanol is a more viscous solvent, which can help push out tiny bubbles that can be stuck in your tubing. So far, we've covered the solvents and the degasser. Now, let's take a look at the pump. One of the main measures of system performance for your LC is the system pressure. Always keep an eye on your system pressure. Even when your system is working properly, it's helpful to record the pressures for the system with your method and even at different points of tubing connection. This can help you identify quickly when your system might be changing or needing a bit of preventative maintenance. The pressure ripple can also be monitored in ChemStation. This is a useful diagnostic tool. You wanna see a stable pressure ripple it shouldn't be fluctuating wildly if you're pumping the same mobile phase composition on an equilibrated system. If there is excessive pressure ripple, there may be an issue with the pump. Looking at the behavior, whether it's rhythmic or erratic, and how large the fluctuation is can be helpful. Note that on newer instruments, there may be alternative pump technology and diagnostic pump features that you would also need to monitor. Now, what if you do have a pressure ripple or pressure fluctuations? It could be caused by any number of issues and it may result in things like baseline noise, shifts or affect the retention times. Basically, your solvent composition isn't being delivered consistently. Many times this is caused by an air bubble trapped in the system. If you suspect an air bubble, it's best to flush the system with an organic solvent. Methanol or acetonitrile may already be on your system and easy to use, 
but a more viscous solvent like isopropanol can help push out air bubbles that may be stuck. And prime all of the lines. You can use 25% on all of the channels. Another consideration for pressure fluctuations is that your inlet or outlet check valve may have a minor internal leak or have backflow due to overuse. Seals may also be dirty or worn. You want to replace these one by one and check if they resolve your pump issues. You can also use some diagnostic tools like Lab Advisor to run a diagnostic leak test that can help indicate which valve is malfunctioning. Here's a look at an Agilent pump head with an active inlet valve, which is quite common. It has an electronic cable connection, which you disconnect from the pump after shutting off the power to the module. Then unscrew the valve and replace the inlet filter cartridge as shown here. Again, different instruments have slightly different designs. For example, the Agilent 1290 LC uses a passive inlet valve instead. That is a one-piece design. Here is the outlet ball valve on the top of the pump head. This can be removed with a 14 millimeter wrench, similar to the active inlet valve. The outlet ball valve is a one-piece design, but outlet ball valves on older instruments had a separate gold seal on this end right here. You can still replace this gold seal on the older outlet valves. However, if you need to replace the whole valve, you will get one of the newer one-piece valves, which are backwards compatible all the way back to 1100 instruments. Typically, if a tiny bit of debris from your instrument or an incorrectly installed valve this can affect the seating of the gold seal in this valve, which can cause pump issues. Another common seal that can wear out and leak in your pump are the pump seals, also known as piston seals or plunger seals. These are inside the pump head. Here's a diagram showing an exploded view of what is inside. This will require you to take apart the pump head. It's pretty straightforward with the toolkit and the manual, but whether you want to tackle this will depend on your company policies and your comfort level. Now there are two types of pump seals. The black seal is for most reversed phase and GPC applications. For normal phase solvents using hexane or heptane, you will want to use the yellow norm normal phase seal. 1290 systems only have one seal option. The pump seals are something you will want to replace on a regular basis before there is a problem. Set up a replacement schedule for your instrument based on usage and the mobile phase composition. The purge valve sits on the pump head and you've probably used this feature before. When the purge valve is opened by unscrewing this knob, the flow from the pump is sent right to waste bypassing the rest of the instrument. This is really handy to prime the degasser and the pump when switching solvents. On some systems, the purge valve unscrews from the front of the pump head, and on other systems, there's a separate bracket holding the purge valve to the pump head. Once the pur purge valve assembly is removed, you will find a gold seal. This gold seal can be popped off, and underneath is a PTFE frit. Replace this frit as well as the gold seal cap routinely. Now, dirty frits are a common cause of high pressure in an LC system. On many systems, the frit is easy to replace and can be a quick first step in troubleshooting pressure issues. Let's take a look at an example pump issue. One day, you might be running repeated injections of the same sample without changing any method conditions you may see retention times shift earlier or later. It may appear random, or it could be minor or drastic. 
Retention times can shift due to multiple issues, including your column conditioning. However, consider that all pumps, whether they're binary or quaternary, mix solvent compositions using what we call a proportioning valve. The solvent lines go into this valve via a fitting, and the combined mobile phase at the correct composition goes out to the next module in the LC. After considerable use, the connections in this valve can leak. The valve can malfunction, and all of a sudden, the mobile phase composition can be incorrect. And so there can be more or less percentage of, of one solvent. In this particular case, you might suspect the proportioning valve. Certain types of pumps, which we call quaternary pumps, will have a multi-channel gradient proportioning valve. Binary pumps will have what we call a solvent selection valve. Both valves allow the pump to vary solvent mixtures and form gradients. Take good care of this valve by avoiding blockages and leaks by flushing out buffer salts when changing mobile phases. With any pump issue, it may be helpful to premix solvents to test an isocratic separation. This can help troubleshoot whether the, the issue is with only one solvent line, maybe in the degasser or going into the proportioning valve. It can also help you identify whether a pump issue is related to one pump head over another if you have a binary pump. Testing this out can help you speed up your troubleshooting and get you back on your way to using your system successfully. Next up in our flow path is the auto sampler. There are many different kinds of auto samplers. Some can sample vials, some well plates. Some like the Agilent multi sampler can hold a mixture of different vials and well plates. However, the basic functionality of an auto sampler is generally the same. Let's look at some of the common issues you might run into with an auto sampler. Since your auto sampler is where your sample gets injected, where it's introduced into the LC system's flow path, this can be a major source of contamination and carryover from run to run. You might also see ghost peaks that show up randomly within your run, maybe high back pressure or generally inconsistent responses. It's particularly important to keep your auto sampler components well maintained to reduce the chance of carryover from run to run. Common sources of auto sampler issues include the exterior of the needle, a worn needle seat, a worn rotor seal in the injection valve, or a poorly made fitting. These last three can create dead volume for sample to hide. Let's take a look at some diagrams, which will help illustrate this. For simplicity, let's look at the standard auto sampler setup here and the location of each of these components. The needle, the needle seat, the injection valve, the loop capillary, and the metering device. The loop capillary can be a source of blockage and lead to high pressures. If you do replace the loop capillary, be sure that you connect it at the proper angle to prevent distortion and breakage. The needle seat is a common source of wear after tens of thousands of injections. In this diagram, we have the needle, which is seated into the needle seat. As the needle enters the needle seat and sample is delivered into the needle seat, the contact point between the needle and the seat can erode, leaving tiny points of wear in which sample can hide. This can cause carryover or ghost peaks. Now, Agilent needle seats are designed to last a really long time, but eventually wear is bound to happen. Another issue you may find is if you're injecting particularly dirty samples, you may clog the needle seat capillary, which can result in high system back pressure upon injection. So keep an eye on your pressures. If you do need to replace the needle seat, always replace both the needle 
and the needle seat at the same time. Typically, if there's wear on the needle seat, the needle is also not seating right or may have wear marks. Now, once the sample gets injected again, it travels in through the needle seat, through the seat capillary, and into the injection valve. There are a number of capillary connections to this valve. A diagram of the internal workings of the valve is shown here. Now, a common part that needs replacing in the valve is the rotor seal. In the image here, you can see the sample comes in through one fitting and transfers through tiny grooves on the rotor seal and back out through the valve. Proper installation of the capillary fittings into this valve is essential to avoid dead volume. The rotor seal material is very robust, but those tiny grooves can wear out over 30 to 40,000 injections. And when this part wears out, the sample doesn't transfer properly, and you could see broader peaks, carryover, and generally poor reproducibility. Now, if you do take this valve apart, just be sure to label the tubing according to the number of the port and keep track of the order and direction that the parts should go back together. You'll notice each port is labeled with a number. The user manual contains diagrams and you may also find it useful to take notes or take pictures to keep track of components. While the rotor seal is a consumable part and requires periodic replacement, the other parts here do not typically need to be replaced. Still, be sure that all parts are free of debris, dust, buffer salts, or other contaminants. Be aware that rotor seals are typically VESPEL material, but other materials are available for specific pH or instrument models. Now again, here's the diagram showing the various parts of the valve. When changing a rotor seal, the capillary fittings are removed from the injection valve ports on the stator head. Keep track again of which fitting came from which port. This is really important. Loosen the screws in the stator head, remove the stator head, the stator ring, and the rotor seal. Replace the rotor seal and reassemble the valve. You'll notice that some valves have a stator face, but that's just the 400 bar and bioinert valves only. These other parts of the valve, like the stator face, or the isolation seal. Um, these can be replaced, but in general, they're not a routine sort of thing. In addition to the needle seat, the injection valve is a common source of carryover, as I mentioned. If a capillary is poorly installed, a small bit of dead volume can be created. This is definitely a common source of carryover, as well as peak shape problems. A worn rotor seal can create crevices for sample to hide, causing carryover. Since many auto sampler components should be replaced at the same time, Agilent offers a number of maintenance kits for our auto samplers, which include just about everything you might need to keep up the performance of your auto sampler. Kits make it really easy and fast to find the exact components you need for your system so you aren't spending time hunting for the right part for your system. Also important for the auto sampler is your choice of vial. Agilent auto samplers use two milliliter wide opening vials. For the best performance of your Agilent auto sampler, choose Agilent certified vials. Agilent certified vials are the only vials designed and tested for full compatibility with our auto samplers. Many Agilent auto samplers use a robotic arm to grip vials by the neck. Therefore, it's critical that the vial neck and shoulder are the proper height to prevent dropped vials and lost samples. Only Agilent certified vials are designed for use on Agilent auto samplers. Competitor products do not meet our exact specifications, which could lead to costly instrument downtime and potential loss of your precious samples. Now, on top of that vial, 
I would recommend choosing an Agilent bonded cap. With a bonded cap, the septum is attached to the cap rather than simply being press fit in. By choosing a bonded cap, you can prevent push through of the septum down into the vial. And also check out the site here. It can help guide you to the best vial and cap for your particular application. Now, if you happen to have an Agilent well-played auto sampler, now you could be using vials, but there's probably a good chance you are using well plates. If so, you will want to choose Agilent Infinity Lab well plates and ceiling mats, which are a perfect fit in Agilent Infinity Lab auto samplers. Each plate has a corresponding ceiling mat. All the plates and mats have been tested to demonstrate perfect suitability in Agilent instruments, and they are designed to conform to the American National Standard Institute and the Society for Laboratory Automation and Screening Standards. All the plates are made in a resistant polypropylene and are compatible with the typical reverse phase HPLC solvents you might be using. And all of them are made, uh, all the mats are made with silicone and are pre-slit. So they're optimized for use with an Agilent HPLC auto sampler. You can check out more at the address listed here. Next in the flow path is the thermostatted column compartment where the column is installed. Not much routine maintenance is really required here, but we're still working with columns, capillaries, and fitting connections. So let's take a look at making sure those are worry-free. There are many dimensions and lengths for capillary tubing. Most Agilent LC systems primarily use 0.17 or 0.12 millimeter ID or internal diameter tubing. Smaller ID tubing is used for higher pressure UHPLC systems to ensure minimal system volume to avoid band spreading. Agilent tubing is color coded by ID, by the internal diameter, for easy identification. Capillary kits can make it easy to find the right tubing and fitting combinations. As each system is configured optimally, it is important to know what is on your instrument. When replacing a blocked, leaking, or broken piece of tubing, be sure to replace with the same internal diameter and length. The volume of the tubing affects the system volume, which in turn can affect peak shapes and retention times. When replacing tubing on your instrument, the ID and the length of the tubing you use really matters. You want to make sure you do not inadvertently increase the volume of your LC system, causing a problem. The two chromatograms here demonstrate the effect of increased tubing volume on a separation. We can see significant peak broadening when larger volume tubing is installed between the autosampler and the column. Improperly seated fittings are a common source of leaks and peak shape issues. Keep in mind that different manufacturers supply different types of fittings, so you'll want to be sure to use the right fittings for your system. Agilent LC systems typically use swage lock type fittings. These can be the standard three-piece stainless steel fitting shown here. Here's a diagram, diagram showing some of the common fitting styles available from different manufacturers. As I mentioned, Agilent primarily uses the swage lock fitting shown here. Note the length of the tubing that extends past the front ferrule. Now this varies depending on the fitting type. So it's really, again, really important that you choose the fitting that's designed to go with your LT system. Proper seating of fittings is of utmost importance throughout all of your LC connections. If the tubing extends too long past the ferrule, the ferrule cannot seat properly and leaks will occur. If the tubing is too short past the ferrule, a dead volume is created and mixing can occur in this tiny void. This could broaden or split peaks or maybe cause tailing, especially if you see it on early eluding peaks. It can also be a source of carryover. 
Now a properly installed fitting is perfectly flush with zero dead volume. We can see here a chromatogram that shows the impact of just one poorly installed fitting on an LC system, resulting in consistently poor peak shapes. Many Agilent capillaries come pre-swaged or with the fitting pre-attached to ensure a good fit. However, there will be times when you will need to swage a fitting yourself. Here are five simple steps to follow for making good connections. Step one, select a nut that is the right length for the fitting. Step two, slide the nut over the end of the tubing. Step three, carefully slide the ferrule components on after the nut. Finger tighten the assembly while making sure the tubing is completely seated at the bottom of the end fitting. Step four, use a quarter inch wrench to gently tighten the fitting by one quarter to one half turn where you want to connect it. This will force the ferrule to seat onto the tubing, but make sure you don't over tighten. Now the wrench you use on the column might vary. It's going to depend on the particular column you're using. Step five, once you're sure your fitting is complete, loosen the nut and inspect the ferrule to make sure it's at the correct position on the tubing. Ideally, each standard swage lock fitting should be swaged to match the exact column or valve where it will be used. A perfectly swaged fitting can take some practice and can be challenging to achieve consistently, especially if you change columns frequently. Instead, a newer option is the Agilent Infinity Lab Quick Connect and Quick Turn fittings. They have a spring-loaded design, require no tools, and are reusable and work for all column types. Every user can get a perfect zero dead volume connection every time. This is a real time saver, allowing you to analyze more samples rather than fiddle with fittings or troubleshoot leaks. The quick connect fitting shown here is finger tight up to 1300 bar. All you have to do is hand tighten the nut and depress the lever. The spring-loaded design pushes the capillary constantly toward the receiving port, again guaranteeing a consistent zero dead volume installation. The quick turn fitting is finger tight up to 400 bar, but this can be extended to 1300 bar when tightened with a wrench, shown here. The more compact design is great when space is tight. Now, there are many questions that probably are going to come up during method development in regards to the column you're using. You might ask, why should I track my column use? Does it make sense to use this column, or should I instead use a fresh one to get reliable results? If you're troubleshooting, is the problem caused by my column, or is there a different issue? Some of the questions you might ask yourself include, I found this column, how old is it? How many injections did I perform so far? Which temperature and pH does my column withstand? Where can I find the batch number of my column? When was the last time that I used my column? Efficient tracking of column usage with Infinity Lab column ID tags can address many of these common questions. The column ID tags keep track of manufacturing date, date of first injection, number of injections, the column pH and temperature stability, date of last injection, description of the column, the serial number, batch number, and much more. If you have a newer Agilent Infinity II column compartment, you can get one of these Infinity Lab column ID tags. Agilent Infinity Lab pore shell columns in the 1.9 micron particle size already come with the tag pre-installed, pre-written with all the information for the column. If you're using a pore shell 120 2.7 micron column, you can add the letter T to the end of the part number, and it will come pre-installed on the column 
with all the column information programmed into the tag. And the same is true. You can add for the four micron columns, you can add a T to the part number, and that, will, again, will get you that tag installed. Now, if you're using another column, you can order a standalone tag. An empty Infinity Lab column ID tag is part number 5067-5917. The Agilent Instrument Control Framework allows you to program the tag independent of the CDS you're using. An Agilent LC instrument with a column ID tag reader is required, though. To reach full compliance, we recommend to lock the tag after all column information was entered. Dynamic fields, like number of injections, will actively track column usage and are changed by the LC instrument and the ICF. Now, exiting the column compartment, we now move into the detector. Let's take a look at how to maximize our uptime and performance with UV detectors. Commonly used UV detectors are the VWD and DAD or the MWD. VWD is variable wavelength detector, DAD is diode array detector, and MWD is the multiple wavelength detector. Maintenance is pretty simple, involving lamp replacement and flow cell cleaning, or maybe repair or replacement of the flow cell. Clean flow cells are critical to sensitive detection and peak response. Remember to consider the pressure rating of your flow cell. A second detector or a fraction collector in the flow path after your UV detector can increase the back pressure on the flow cell. This could cause the flow cell to leak. You'll want to make sure the flow cell contains 5 or 10% organic to prevent microbial growth when it's not in use. I can speak from experience here. I once left an instrument on a holiday break. It had water in the flow cell. It came back. There was algae growing in it. Also avoid leaving buffer solutions in the flow cell, which could crystallize and cause a blockage or particulate interference. Here's a photo showing the locations of the lamp and flow cell on a diode array detector, or DAD. Diode array detectors have both deuterium and tungsten lamps. In this UV detector, the flow cell has a spring-loaded clamp which holds it in the module. Should your flow cell leak or require maintenance, Agilent offers convenient flow cell repair kits. Here's a photo showing the locations of the lamps and flow cell on a 1290 diode array detector. The flow cells shown here is what we call the max light cartridge, which is very easy to handle. On 1290 and some 1260 systems, a cartridge format flow cell is used, which has a distinct baseline and sensitivity advantage. Again, we call this the max light cartridge cell. Instead of typical flow cell windows, the cartridge actually contains a fused silica capillary and uses total internal reflection to increase light transmission. As usual, do not leave buffers in the cartridge for extended periods of time. And if a leak occurs, replacement is the only option. There's no repair kit for the cartridge. The cartridge should be stored in isopropanol or methanol when not in use. Note that the MaxLight cartridges and Agilent lamps are, are available with an RFID tag, enabling usage tracking with certain Agilent LC systems and software. This is extremely helpful to help you map out preventative maintenance timeline for replacement, lessening poor quality data, and reducing system downtime. Here are a few helpful notes on Agilent UV lamps. They are the only lamps designed and certified for Agilent detectors. They have a much narrower aperture, which provides increased light intensity and decreased noise versus the competition. Agilent long-life lamps can last up to 2,000 hours. So keep this in mind. 
Your lamp life can be tracked within your LC system software. When changing a lamp, do not touch the glass bulb. Any deposit in the light path can affect the performance of the lamp. And when turning the lamp on, it's best to wait about 10 minutes for the lamp to warm up. Here's an example comparing a lamp from Agilent with a lamp from another supplier. As you can see, signal to noise is significantly better with the Agilent lamp. Also, baseline drift is a real problem with this competitor lamp. The lamp's light might look the same on the outside, but they are not the same. Agilent lamps have been designed and optimized for each specific detector. Here's a few troubleshooting tips. As I mentioned, it's important to monitor your back pressure, keep track of it, and look for pressure fluctuations. This can help you identify a potential problem early on to avoid a lot of troubleshooting later on. If you're working on troubleshooting a pressure issue, disconnect capillary tubing one module or one section at a time while observing the pressure changes. Maybe disconnect the connection at the front of the column first and keep moving back until you can identify where that pressure was. If you're troubleshooting whether the pump is mixing your solvents correctly, it can be helpful to pre-mix the solvent and run it just out of one channel in the pump. This can help isolate, again, whether the pump is proportioning it prop properly or if it's something to do with um, uh, maybe something with your method or the column. Look for bubbles in your solvent lines. Again, if you start to have bubbles and you have trouble getting them, clearing them out, running isopropanol can help flush that out a little bit better than some other solvents. Check your connections uh, your minor for minor leaks with the tip of a lint-free paper wipe. And it's important to run repeated blanks injections. Um, running blanks can really help, help you know what your system looks like without any sample. If you do have an Agilent LC system, there are a few diagnostic tools that are available to you. You may have seen something like this before, the Infinity Series Instant Pilot. It helps you monitor system parameters, run system tests, and diagnostics. And there's a newer version, the Infinity Lab LC Companion, which is tablet-based as well. I may have mentioned it earlier, but there's Lab Advisor software available to you as well. It comes with Agilent LCs, so if you haven't opened it up, if you haven't used it, definitely check it out. It can help you troubleshoot. It can help you do all the maintenance you need to do on your LC system. And there are some additional applications like hardware familiarization or maintenance wizard that can be installed as well. So here's a screenshot inside Agilent Lab Advisor for LC. If you haven't checked it out, if you haven't opened it up, please definitely do so. Inside, you'll find diagnostic tests you can run for the pump, as well as your detectors, auto samplers, and it can guide you through step-by-step -step if you do need to do some maintenance. Agilent Lab Advisor has what we call EMF counters, or early maintenance feedback. The system is tracking usage of the parts within the system. So this can help you guide when you might need maintenance and can also help you develop a PM schedule based on your system usage. Another piece of software that is available is what we call Agilent CrossLab Smart Alerts. Once you install Smart Alerts and connect it to your instruments, the software compares your instrument use data against application-based insights from Agilent. Now, this data is customizable for your application and workload. And you then can receive alerts in a single email or in a dashboard when recommended limits are reached. You can learn more about Agilent CrossLab Smart Alerts at the address listed here. Now, throughout this talk, you've heard me mention Infinity Lab. The core Infinity Lab family is made up of the Infinity Lab LC Instrument Series, the LC MSD, 
and key consumables that are leading products for improving efficiency in the lab. Infinity Lab Porsche 120 columns, Infinity Lab Quick Connect and Quick Turn fittings, the Infinity Lab Flex Bench family, Infinity Lab Stay Safe caps and solvent bottles, Infinity Lab well plates, and premium Agilent LC lamps. You can rely on Agilent Infinity Lab instruments, columns, and supplies to deliver rugged quality and robust analytical results. Every component of the Agilent Infinity Lab family is uniquely designed to work together and to help you continuously improve your workflow for efficiency gains that help you get more done and reduce operational costs. Now for your future reference, here's a list of resources. If you're looking for additional training, definitely check out Agilent University. For tech support, there's an address you can go to with all kinds of helpful resources for you. We have another resource page as well, and here you'll find things like quick reference guides, catalogs, the column user guides, uh, various online selection tools, as well as how-to videos. Earlier I mentioned the Infinity Lab Supplies Catalog that has all kinds of supplies for your Agilent LC systems. And if you're new to LC, check out the LC Handbook. Another helpful document to have on hand is called Best Practices for Using an Agilent LC System. Also, check out the LC Troubleshooting Poster. Now you can find all of these. You should be able to pull them up just by typing in the publication number in the search bar on Agilent.com. And one more thing, if you haven't checked it out yet, on YouTube, there's an Agilent channel that has some really nice maintenance videos. So, just to summarize, I've covered a wide variety of LC modules, and all are slightly different. Please refer to the manual for the maintenance details on the specific modules in your system. It's going to be a little bit different if you have an 1100 series, a 1200, 1260, 1290, or a newer Infinity 2 system. Now, I've tried to touch on it as I've moved through the talk, but there are some parts you'll want to replace on a regular basis before there's a problem, and others should be kept on hand in case there is a problem, but they don't necessarily need to be replaced with any frequency. I'm sure you're probably wondering how often should I change the active inlet valve cartridge or change the purge valve fret, or how often should I change my pump seal? Unfortunately, this is not a question I can easily answer for you in an overview, overview talk such as this. But I hope I've given you some points to think and talk about as you develop a maintenance routine that works for you. I also hope that I've covered some tips that can help you prevent instrument downtime before there's a problem rather than simply fixing things when something goes wrong. It's important to learn how to quickly identify common LC issues to get your system back up and running as soon as possible. And I hope you'll take advantage of new technologies and tools to help simplify your day-to-day -day LC activities. And as always, we're here to help. Please, if you're unsure, just ask us. We'd be glad to assist. And thank you so much for your attention today.